Uh, welcome to this week's lecture, already lecture four. And today we're going to start how to measure distances. First, uh, so smaller ones like our Earth, well, Earth Moon, uh, and then uh, stuff that where we could fly to, and then uh, solar system, and then we go out towards uh, uh, our Milky Way, at least our quarter of the Milky Way, and then bigger distances. What means uh, we will today start also with cosmology. So what do we think how the universe evolved and maybe can we test the very early stages? So today we will really distances and let's say the oops no of course no the first guy who wanted to measure the, the size of the earth and back then the hellenistic period following alexander the great where in alexandria was a the famous library and attached loads of scholars and one of them was eratosthenes and he believed that the Earth is a sphere. Well, he had a relatively good argument because he traveled to uh, Sudan, which means south of Egypt. And there at the uh, uh, summer solace, basically the sun is perpendicular on the surface of the Earth. So if you dig a, a well, when you sit in, you don't see a shadow at noon. Then you measure basically, okay, this is true. And the next year, some of the list, you look in Alexandria and measure basically tower where you know the height, length of an, uh, the shadow. Therefore, you can get the angle under which the sun rays were incident. Okay, <clears throat> which is here no longer perpendicular. So obviously, there is some difference. And if you believe it's a sphere and the sun is then always shining from the same direction, you measure in Alexandria at noon, the summer sun is seven and a half degrees, or the incident of the sun rays. Then you know that the distance between Alexandria and the Suyene is back then it was 5000 stadia. Obviously, the Greeks measured in, uh, if we would say, 100 meter runs, which corresponds roughly to 800 kilometers. Okay, so you have now a certain distance that corresponds to this arc length of the surface of the sphere. You know the opening angle. So this is a part of basically of the circumference, which is given as 2 pi the radius. So next is you just say that this angle towards 360 degree must be this length relative to the circumference. So you get this length to by the radius, resolve for the radius, and you get for the radius of the Earth from this simple measurement about 6,100 kilometers, what is quite close to this, I think, 5,770 kilometers, or something like this. So, congratulations. Well, and probably you had also a good laugh when you heard the name Eratosthenes. If I'm honest, the first time I've seen it, I saw this, saw this is a man in rather horizontal business, but okay. So back then, the method nowadays, what we do is, of course, we use time of flight methods of signals. And this is nowadays, of course, the global positioning system, GPS. 
you can nicely map them or uh, basically the surface of the earth just by having knowing that the speed of light is constant mostly it's a bit slow down in the atmosphere but otherwise it's relatively good so you can then calculate back from knowing the relative position of a couple of these satellites and uh, so there are 30, 30 for gps in the sky and now europe comes with galileo i'm pretty sure the chinese need their own one well if you want to play superpower you probably need this this helps you to guide your missiles into the into where you want to have them okay what they use basically that this time of flight is relatively precise what means you need you reduce it again you emit and you have a timestamp you need a clock a very precise clock on board of these satellites and then the other one, of course, needs the same uh, or at least a similar precise clock. Well, and then you can basically map the distance corresponds to the speed of light multiplied with the time difference or the time between emission and uh, arrival. Well, yet the problem is, of course, when you have the uh, stationary over the Earth, this means the Earth rotates, they also need to rotate. And because they are further away from the axis of rotation, they need to go faster. And the point on Earth, going fast, the theory of relativity. Fast, do you remember the, the guy in the spaceship with the mirrors? For him appeared the time to be slower compared to an observer at rest. That means these satellites, because they move faster, their time seems to go a bit slower. Appears relative to this other reference frame. This is one effect. An effect that counters this is that if you are close, if you have a clock basically in zero gravitation, An observer that is in a strong gravitational field, so next to a big mass, for the latter again, the clock seems to go a bit slower. Effectively, if you go on the event horizon of what is called a black hole, so massive supermass, uh, light can not even escape because gravity or the, the, the disturbance in, in space-time is so strong that it cannot make it away, then the time would stand still or almost come to a standstill. So if you want to become very, very old, pick yourself a black hole, go there, stay next to the event horizon. Yet you might be, become what is called spaghettified. Okay, so these two effects, and they, they work in the opposite direction. So if uh, on Earth, basically, the blocks seem to go slower than compared to a satellite. So if you go from one system to another system. But in general, there is still a net effect. It's not that they cancel away. Is that there is still this net effect. If, and if we don't co compensate for this, this theory of relativity, of special relativity, as defined 1915 by Einstein, or published 1950 by Einstein, then, well, the GPS would be off every second by about 20 meters. That means that after a minute, you are basically a kilometer off. Oh, and then I uh, don't know whether the uh, Satnav would send you. So this needs to be compensated. And at the moment, the problem is uh, you will be precise to about two to three meters. And the problem is 
the, the clocks. They have still a bit of a, a uncertainty in the time measurement. This corresponds then to this two or three meters. But we are you now working on clocks that might be, or well, not me, but let's say my colleague uh, Peter Tirol from Munich does. He works on clocks that might be a factor 100 better than what we have currently. And then we reduce this uncertainty basically to a few centimeters. That means if you car mouse, the position so closely, then it, at least it probably can park on its own. That would then be a big step forward for autonomous driving. Of course, you still need all these sensors to uh, to look whether the person is walking over the, the, the street or when parking, whether there is already a car parked and not that the Satnav tries to park in five, five cars in the same spot. Who knows? Okay, but what I want to show you is that again here, the theory of relativity is relatively important and comes immediately into game. So, so our Earth is then relatively fine. With the Moon, is also fine because the satellite, uh, the the astronauts, they were there, and they left mirrors. And what is occasionally done, so every year, at least once or twice, that people send extreme powerful laser beams towards these mirrors. And then you wait for the flash of the returning light. And you measure the time in between, you know, speed of light, and you can measure down to a couple of millimeters. The precision or the distance between this mirror and the emitter. And it turns out that the moon uh, is drifting away by a few centimeters every year. This comes because it stopped this uh, internal or it slowed down this internal rotation. And now this energy that was in the rotation it's taken that it drifts out of the gravitational field of the Earth. Or oh. oh, at some point we have to say goodbye, farewell moon. Okay, but what means we have then easily also measured the, the distance moon to, uh, moon, to, moon to Earth. But how about in our solar system? How do we know what is an astronomical unit? Yet, our solar system, the structure of our solar system, there were, at least from our European point of view, I don't know, maybe there might have been Chinese astronomers who knew it before, or the United States astronomers, maybe even Babylonian. There are a lot of smart people before as Europeans in the, on this planet. So, yet in Europe, we would say uh, two essential figures for the structure of our solar system were the guy here on the left, Tycho Brahe, the uh, Danish lad, and Johannes Kepler, depending where you ask. If you ask me as German, I would say German. If you ask somebody from Czech, from Prague, he would say it's Czech. And I would say, but in general, we can say it's a, from a beer-loving European country. So, and to your point, well, this is quite illustrious figure. What you see here, this nose on this picture, this was a fake nose. Seemingly, he lost his nose when he was a young man and studied mathematics. And he had a fight with one of his... Uh, comrades about an equation. And this fight ended up that they were dueling each other and he got his nose chopped off. Oh. Oh, what an outcome. Well, also, but nevertheless, he was a rich Danish noble in, and he made his garden basically to appear nicely to perfectly suited as observatory. And he took fantastic data. Seemingly, he had a very, very good eyesight. 
So he nicely noted down the position of planets, stars, whatever, every night. That was where it was possible. Well, some nights he had also had to attend uh, the king's court, and it's later on that he basically, uh, uh, it's not clear, the rumor says he died of a bladder problem with the bladder, because back then, uh, when you were at the king's court, and the, that was the meal, or probably after the meal also good drinking going on, you were not allowed to leave the table until the king went off. And then you were sitting there, and after a couple of pints, you can imagine. <laughs> oh, and seemingly his bladder was still wrecked. So he took all this data, but he couldn't make sense of it. So he got himself uh, somebody who is thought to be mathematically more talented, and this is Johannes Kepler. And Kepler, well, he was then uh, quickly realizing Kepler is really much better than mathematically than I was, and seemingly he withhold data from him. So it was then hard for Kepler to do his job without insufficient information. But then when he was about to die, he gave basically his entire data to Kepler and told him, please, please, do something with this data. Don't let me have lived for nothing. Oh, and what Kepler was doing with this data, he came up with what is called the three Kepler slopes, which basically uh, define the structure of our, uh, what to say, of the Milky Way. Uh, not the Milky Way, sorry, stupid of our solar system. So, okay. And the, the Kepler's law are the first Kepler's law. The orbit of a planet is an ellipse, highly heretical back then, where a sphere or a circle is a highly symmetric stuff. You can rotate it as much as you want. So, this was already hard to accept for the Catholic Church that the Earth might not be in the center, that the Sun might be in the center, and then this guy comes along. It's not even circles, the planets move. Uh, there was some heavenly spherical symmetry, and, oh, and this guy comes along, no, these are ellipses. And the Sun is in one of the foci of the ellipse, that means uh, our foci. If you would now send out here rays, that would get reflected. Incoming angle equals the outgoing angle that they always go in this uh, focal plane or focal point. Yet for the Earth, this is the difference is long axis is 152 million and the, the short one is the 148 million. So this eccentricity is very, very small, but Obviously, Kepler was smart enough to, to see this. So, Kepler's first law. Well, what you also see, huh, this is something nice. <laughs> Again, one of the successes of uh, theory of relativity. This perial, so the, how the ellipse is oriented, this is rotating with time. And classical mechanics can't explain this, but Einstein, Einstein could explain it with his theory. So another very big success of the theory of relativity, which so far all predictions have been verified. But there seems to be something to it. So this is the per perial rotation. So Kepler's first law, planets move on ellipses. Kepler's second law, a line segment joining a planet and the sun sweeps out equal areas during equal interval of time. So if you have a week and your planet is closer to the sun, well, if it's 
rotating this way around, obviously, if it's closer, it's a bit faster. If it's moving further away from the sun, it will slow down a bit. And then the mass multiplied with the velocity, this defines us what is called the momentum. So, and if the momentum is then smaller, obviously the line segment that is covered here is shorter. But what turns out that the product of the radius multiplied with this uh, velocity at a point, this is uh, constant. Mathematically, we would write this as oops, Hopefully this works. No, but a pen. Hopefully you can see this. Probably not. Uh, no, doesn't really work at the moment. What is preserved R multiplied with the, the momentum? Or usually mathematically we reduce two vectors because both quantities have a direction. And it turns out this is the cross product, the radius cross the momentum. This is constant. And the quantity that is this corresponds to this is the angular momentum. Angular momentum, what? So we will come back to this quantity quite often. Angular momentum, where do you experience this? Well, if you cycle, your wheels they have a different radius obviously and outside uh, where the mass is really distributed you have a given velocity and a given mass so you have their momentum of the wheel itself or on the surface of the wheel the points obviously perpendicular to the spokes and this defines you know again this Dot pro uh, cross product of the spoke lengths multiplied with the, this velocity multiplied with the, the, the mass. This defines us an angular momentum and the cross product spokes. No, the unshare, stop share. Cross product R. Oh, wait, I told you, okay. Radius, the momentum. Here's basically the, the wheel, uh, the center of the wheel, the spoke lengths, and now the speed. Ah. And then you get the third finger coming up perpendicular, gives you the angular momentum cross product. And this stays, is basically perpendicular on the axis where you have the bicycle wheel. So when you start cycling and you're, you're very slow, it's usually very shaky. Oh. There is no angular momentum really that is wants to be preserved. While if you faster, you can even take off the hands of the steering. Of course, you should do. And if you fall, that's not my fault. It's yours. Don't do it. But the system is so stable that you could do. So I'm always impressed if you see this uh, to the frost guys with 40 kilometers an hour having their their drinks and. They don't play cards next to us. So this is the angular momentum that stabilizes. If you're a motorcyclist, you probably notice that if you want to make a right turn, that costs you quite some force to, to twist the steerer. But what you do is a quick push towards the left and then go towards the right. And what you break is this angular momentum conservation. daily effect but here it's no causing that basically oh, let me go back to screen, hopefully shared yeah, just no not pen that basically this area here at a given time interval is always the same and this area corresponds to the angular momentum. 
But now for us, the important thing is what Kepler realized is that the square of the orbital period, so if it takes one year, one uh, revolution per year to, to go once around the sun, and here the square of, of a planet is proportional to the cube of the semi major axis, which semi major axis between uh, in the ellipse basically you have uh, two axes that are defined go back. So one major axis, the long axis, and you have the short axis. And the major semi axis is obviously here, this is going along. Okay. So basically, the revolution period t squared is proportional to the cube of this length of this uh, axis. It means we have now, all we have to observe is when is a planet again in front of the same constellation as it was last time. Then we get the orbital period. Of course, um, this would be seen from the Sun, but from the Earth it works, of course, for very far outer planet, but for inner planet it's, it takes a while to fiddle out how long they, they need to orbit. Then we can get how far are they away from the sun. So it's this third law of Kepler that helps us to, to measure distances in the solar system. So this proportionality, the t squared proportional to r to the power of 3. Or if we write it with an equal sign, there must be some constant which here we have a volume and here we have a time squared. So time squared divided by volume must be the, the dimension. But if we take it relative of two planets, aha, then basically we just divide one divided by the other equation. These constants are cancelling away and we directly get a proportionality. And now we take the third, the third root of both sides. So we have a ratio of the semi major axis of one planet towards the other planet. And all we have to measure for this ratio is the orbital period. So doing so, well, we define for the for Venus, we get 225 days. For Earth, obviously, it is 365. And yeah, usually a quarter on top. Plugging this into this formula, we get as radius the ratio that the, the Venus, if we say this is a sphere or a circle, that its radius would be 0 0.72 times the Earth's radius. For Mars with 450 or for two years, you can now calculate that it's how far it is away relative towards the Earth. What means since we had defined basically the, the, the radius of the Earth's orbit as an astronomical unit roughly. Ah, in terms of astronomical units, we are fine. There we can classify now just by looking at this orbital period, thanks to Tycho Brahe and Kepler. We have this in terms of astronomical units, the, the solar system fixed. Now we need to measure somehow the astronomical unit in terms of uh, uh, how to say ah. uh,
SI units, meters and kilometers. Sorry that it took so long. Okay. And what we can do there, we can use. When do we see basically the 0 0.72 ratio? 0 0.72 astronomical units, one astronomical unit. Best when the Venus is between us on Earth and on the Sun. So and then, if we have a feeling of how big the Sun is or how big everything is, well, we would see if from the northern hemisphere the Venus transiting the Sun while we are basically moving along, we are a bit slower, this, the Venus is a bit faster, obviously. Uh, we are faster, but in terms of angular velocity. Uh, the Venus is uh, uh, slower. It means the angle with which it would uh, it's faster because it makes more per day than we. But in terms of absolute velocity, of course, the Earth must go a far, far bigger way. And therefore, we are a bit faster. So, we see anyway at some point the Venus transiting the Sun. And obviously, there's a slight difference whether you see it from north and south. So, and this time can now be related. If you see it equally from north as well as from the south, and observe it the same way, we can get basically from the Earth the distance via well, we know the baseline, we know how big the Earth is, we know where we are north, where we are south. We had this in the very first lecture. Together with this result by Agatosthenes, so back then the cartographers were much better, the geographers. And then we can measure somehow with the wind via this uh, uh, transiting. The, the, the angle under which we would see the Venus. And if we have the angle, if we have one baseline or one line of the triangle, the rest is trigonometry, we get this distance. And if we have this distance, this is obviously 0 0.28 times the, the, the distance towards the sun. The difference between the uh, uh, sun minus the distance of uh, Venus Sun, that's it. And then we have fixed uh, uh, what is an astronomical unit. And thanks to Kepler, we have fixed oh, the distances in our solar system. And one of the things, or one of the how to do it, well, if you are now, we are obviously in the northern hemisphere. That means in order to observe this, you need to send somebody to the southern hemisphere. And this was one of the motivations. I think it was the second uh, of James Cook's travels to go to a place. Well, I think this is Tuvalu or Tahiti. Not the worst place to travel to. Tuvalu, where do we know it? From the ending tv, dot tv, and the internet addresses. Well, and then there was basically one poor guy, also if he has really done it this way, taking a telescope, pointing it at the sun and looking into it, he was probably blind afterwards. What you do there? <laughs> you take a sheet of paper or something that uh, where you basically focus on something and then you look at this but you don't look directly in the sun especially not if the sunlight is magnified or amplified <laughs> shouldn't do that no. so one of the motivations of the british admiral 
Admirality, Admirality ever to send Captain Cook down to the Southern Seas. A part, of course, to discover land. Well, I think this worked out for Cook's death. Well, this was 1779, 10 years later. I think this was in Hawaii. The Hawaii people obviously had a history book. Because if we look in a history book, we recognize how crap it is to be discovered. That usually doesn't work out well for the for the civilization that is discovered. But usually it it ends that the technological more advanced civilization dominates and the other civilization or society is, is going rather downhill. I worked with the Aborigines, that worked with the Native Americans, that, oh, for the people in Africa, it has had the detrimental effect that many of them were shipped away. It's not good to be discovered. So in case tomorrow they land some, some extraterrestrial, perhaps we shouldn't celebrate because this might be the end, or very likely it is the end of our civilization. Oh, maybe that's a reason to celebrate. Maybe they bring us out to, to, to produce clean energy. Wouldn't be too bad. Okay, so after this excursion, we now know why Captain Cook went to tu Tuvalu. And you know, don't look towards the sun with a telescope. What you do is you behind in the focal plane, you put in some kind of a sheet of paper or something that a piece of wood and then you look at the shadow. That's much better, that's much healthier. Okay, so we have basically our solar system fixed. Nowadays we would do it of course again more precise with uh, having our space probes like Voyager's probes or the Pioneer probes. And look there at the signal time. Basically, uh, you have again two precise clocks, one on board and one on Earth. And then at some point it sends a signal, which is time coded. I am sent now at this time. And then you have your second clock, and at some point the signal comes. You compare what is the signal time, what is the time when you received it. And you know the distance and time of flight, thanks to the speed of light being a constant, at least in vacuum. So solar system nicely measured mostly. <coughs> Good. This leaves us how about our neighborhood? And our neighborhood, what we would, could do is triangulation. If you know the baseline of a triangle, I measure now the angle alpha as well as beta to an object that is out. You can use basic trigonometry to figure out the distance towards this object. Okay, what would be the baseline? You measure this angle every day, every night. <laughs> What means you have one night where you really uh, have the line perpendicular, or this would be basically sun would be here, going out here, and then AB is a diameter of Earth's orbit, because somehow the ellipse and the diameter that is perpendicular. So where the angles are basically equal. Otherwise, one would dominate and the other is a bit smaller. <clears throat> and then it takes trigonometry. Of course, your angle will be 89.99999, whatever. So very close to rectangular, but not exactly. You need to be able to measure the angle extremely precise. 
The other effect is that in, if this year would be a star and you observe summer winter, if you have very, very, very far away ships, you can use what is called the parallax. What is parallax? Okay, unshare. Mm -hmm. And now you take your finger and put it on your nose. Then you close the right eye. You look towards the background of your room. Where is your finger? Then you open the left eye, uh, oh, for me not the right eye, you open the other eye and close the first one and then you see your finger jumping basically relative towards the background. Of course, you know the position is fixed on the top of your nose. Then you take the finger ten, oh, a bit away and do the same game and then you see that the jump of your finger is much, much less compared to this background that is very distant. That is the parallax. Or if you want to make a measurement, you should always look on the scale from above and not from the right, not from the left. There you might get a parallax. So some kind of reading error. At least if you have a point or that is uh, relative towards uh, a scale. So scale, point or and then depends on where which angle you look from. So, back to slides. So this parallax, and this is really, no, this is indeed used. So one can you either measure these angles here, measure the angle here, and then apply the trigonometry, or use the parallax compared to stars that are very, very far away, that not move during summer winter. The ones that move more are closer and the ones that move less are further away. This is the way to map objects that are not too far away. But it works nowadays if you can measure finer and finer, better and better. You can measure quite so tens of thousands of light years. So here is then the picture basically how the star would appear uh, in the summer relative towards these other stars in the background. A bit more shifted towards the left. And then in January we see clearly it has shifted a bit. And from the shift, you know the baseline here again, you know the parallax, how it appears. And we can now go back how, how distant must it be in order to, pro to produce a, such a parallax. This was the first, this was basically done in order to get the distance towards a uh, nearby stars and it worked out quite well it's amazing how people were really able to do this so already 1880 or 1890 okay Oop. so either a triangle by this tangents or via the parallax. And you can, we can always, the nice thing is, we have again here one baseline, ha, <laughs> one astronomical unit. Maybe we should go the other way around and say, this is the real thing. And we have now to define meters in terms of, as a fraction of who knows. So, okay. So we can measure again to nearby stars relatively well using this parallax. <clears throat> and this is effectively done since 2014. The European Space Agency has this Gaia satellite. 
Das ist schon hier. Und was du siehst, ist basically a sun shield, which blocks away the sun radiation, because you want to see fainter objects. So you need to block away the major source of light. Otherwise, you are so, your instruments are so flashed, forget about it. So and then you see here one opening and there's another opening on the others uh, on the 90 degrees or so, 120 degrees, something like this, which let Mrs. Slit. So you observe a narrow part of the of the sky, and then you rotate your stuff underneath. And while you rotate, you see some stars move a bit faster. And on your picture and some move a bit slower and the ones that move faster are the ones that closer to us okay so and you get some relative positioning so summer winter again parallax and gaia well at the beginning wow, they had massive problems what they had So occasionally there was light coming into the instrument flush flooding it completely so this is like a, when you want to see something and then or when you drive and and the guy comes towards you with the with the distant light on and you get completely flashed and you you can't really properly see too much light And this occasionally happened in a special condition and then flush and uh, uh, measurement done and uh, this, this, this. so it turned out that here on the sun shield somewhere some of these glass fibers had, were standing out and then when the sun was coming at a certain angle it was basically you get diffraction of light where light is so strongly bent that it flushed into the scientific instrument. But once recognized, they basically avoid now this angle that this could happen. Smart lens. So very sensitive. And now it uses triangulation. And here, Basic, ah, the next thing is, well, it had a predecessor, which was this Hipparchus, uh, Hipparchus satellite. And the yellow dot in comparison to this uh, 100,000 light years of diameter of our galaxy, Milky Way galaxy with our place, not even in one of the spiral arms. Really, but in the outback or in the oh, bit remote region, what is quite good. It's us and then Hipparchus and then Gaia had the first data released 2017, which is this fetish. They had 2020, I think, the data or 1920, so Christmas around. A data release which was already very impressive and 2022 they think the, the, the mission will be finished and then they will have mapped basically our quarter of our galaxy and it's it's very impressive if you go to Gaia data uh, download they have a program where you basically can fly through <laughs> from the Earth away uh, to, to, to other stars and then look then how is the night sky looking from there, there and very impressive but I have to warn you the when I had downloaded it I didn't expect there comes more than a couple of gigabyte in data so that was um, a bit of blocked internet connection for a while and of course, then the memory at that some point I said, okay. So it should be University Heidelberg and then just Gaia data download or download Gaia map. I have to, would have to check it out. Okay, but now from this Gaia data, ESA has made a very nice film. Therefore, please click on this 
this link here. So this link should catapult you to the ESA website. Up, yeah, but unfortunately you end up with the ESA website quite above. Oh, you got to, you see all these nice films. And then, well, ESA preview, ESA, ESA highlights, ESA whatever, and then Gaia stellar motion. The next 1.6 million years. This is already interesting. There are a lot of videos coming from this data, from the satellite. Well, Gaia astronomical revolution, but universe of Gaia, Gaia's first asteroid survey. And then please, you come to parallax and proper motion. Please click on this video. So switch now this video or pause this video or switch on this video and what you will see is the first 10 seconds, not, not much, just the night sky. And then if you take a careful look, you will see that stars are moving relative to other stars. Then at some point they put in the, so after half a minute, they put in the constellations. And then you see how the stars move relative to each other. And you see some stars have a larger radius of movement. These are the ones that are closer and some are almost not moving. But Gaia, what it also has, it has a spectrometer. It can also get velocities, relative velocities. It can via this Doppler shift of spectral lines. And therefore, it gets the velocity profile of these stars relative to us on a bigger scale. We get the velocity profiles of the stars in our galaxy. What is very interesting, because for example, 90% I think go clockwise and 10% go counterclockwise of the stars. Oops. And this is a very strong evidence of galactic cannibalism, that our Milky Way has eaten other galaxies. Oh. <laughs> so, please enjoy this uh, video. Uh, yeah, at, the, at the end, the last half a minute, they use it then to project how the night sky will evolve in the next couple of thousands of years. So enjoy this. I will now also hope, make a break at this position and before we continue then with this Gaia stuff. But I also need a, a coffee. So see you then after this video. <laughs> 